1 Peter 5 8 tells us to be alert and of sober mind. Your enemy the devil prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. The devil is no one's friend, and he never has good intentions for anyone. His ways are evil and dark. He deceives us into believing we are feeble because he knows that if we understand our true identity and capacities in Christ, we will become immovable and unstoppable. One of the ways the devil prevents us from fully utilizing the authority we have in Christ is by selling us lies, lies that he crafts cunningly. Unfortunately, many believers have become victims of the devil's deception. They live in bondage even when Jesus has granted them victory. Jesus came to this world and destroyed the works of darkness, yet we Christians still live in a state of defeat sometimes. The tricky part of Satan's lies is that they do not appear to be false. They are most times appealing, and they even look like they will benefit you greatly. Just like he deceived Eve in the Garden of Eden to disbelieve what God had told her by convincing her that there was something she was missing out on by not tasting the fruit on the tree. She believed the devil instead and was left to face the consequences of her decision. John 8.44 reads, You belong to your father, the devil, and you want to carry out your father's desires. He was a murderer from the beginning, not holding to the truth, for there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks his native language, for he is a liar and the father of lies. The Bible refers to him as the father of lies. The only language he speaks is a lie. If it is not from God, it is not the truth and not a mix of both. Anything short of God's ordinances and promises is the lie of the devil. The devil's lie is like a beautifully wrapped bomb of which you are unaware of the great danger in the package until you unravel it. Oftentimes, it's always too late to escape from its destruction. But God has provided us the means to be able to detect when the devil is at work through the Spirit of God. If you have not yet been convinced of the atrocities the devil is capable of committing, then take a look at when he tempted Jesus. He said he was going to give the whole world to him. Interesting. He wanted to give the whole world to the owner of the universe. How deceptive can he be? The devil is incredibly wise. God carefully created him, and when he was thrown to the earth, his wisdom and beauty were not taken away from him. One of the lies he tells today is that you can live for God and still love the world and its desires. That is not the truth. If you have chosen the path of eternal life, you must die to self daily by carrying your cross. Painfully, many are named after God, but have no fruit to show. The devil tries to make the youth believe that sexual sin and love for money are not too bad. They are cool ways to enjoy life. Sexual perversion, lukewarmness, worldliness, and fraud have become the order of the day. The lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, and the pride of life are all the enemy's lies. Those involved in this derive pleasure from it for a while until they are faced with the horror it brings. Many have landed in emotional and mental damages that might take a lifetime to be healed. Some won't have the opportunity to retrace their steps before taking their final breath, while the devil is happy to have successfully lured them to destruction. The reason why many venture into shady business is that they are not ready to go through the process of waiting. They want to go through shorter routes because the devil has made them focus on their flesh and blinded them to the troubles ahead. It's not going to be a smooth ride for you as God's child in this wicked world. No, not at all. But God has promised to be with you and help you through every challenge if you put your trust in him and his word. He promised to strengthen you if you will wait on him to lead you on the right path. It might take time, but it is definitely worth the wait. God's plans for his children are beautiful and great. They will come to pass once we can align ourselves with him. God is light and he does not like shifting shadows. So, if the voice you are hearing doesn't look like what I just described, then it is another tactic of the devil. The devil lies to you, that you should not wait for God, and that you can handle things yourself. He also portrays fulfilling your calling as being tough and burdensome. Since you've been yielding to these lies, how far have you gone? One great tool the devil deploys for his evil agenda is ignorance. This is why those who do not spend time on the word of God will always be susceptible to his tricks. When you are ignorant, you don't even know what is good or wrong. No wonder the Bible says God's people perish due to the lack of knowledge. 
Compared to previous generations, we have easier access to the Bible, yet most believers still have never read it. Because of how the devil twists his lies to look attractive, if you don't understand God's word or have a personal relationship with our Father, the devil might have a hold on you. When Jesus was tempted, it was his knowledge of the word that he yielded as a weapon to fight the devil. Although Jesus is the Almighty and he could have destroyed him at the snap of his finger, instead, he showed us how to stand up against the devil. You need to know the word of God by heart to withstand the enemy. You can start from there. Every day, ensure you memorize a verse. That way, you begin to grow and stay acquainted with God's word. There are also Bible apps that help provide a study plan, which makes studying the Bible easier. If you don't like studying alone, you can look out for study partners. Praying and studying with other people really helps you grow spiritually. After memorizing and studying the word, progress to meditating on them. Meditation has a way of bringing your mind to a place of deep understanding of a matter. It will require that you spend more time in your studying. It is vital that you ask questions and get answers to them. You can't win over the devil by your mere understanding. If he dared to face Jesus, be certain that he will come for you. This should not scare you though, you already stand in victory. 2 Corinthians 10, 4 through 6 tells us that the weapons we fight with are not the weapons of the world. On the contrary, they have divine power to demolish strongholds. We demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. And we take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. And we will be ready to punish every act of disobedience once your obedience is complete. The enemy can speak thoughts into your mind that contradict the word of God, which enables him to play on your insecurities and doubts. He can feed you with skeptical and condemning thoughts. He will even try to make you think that his lies are true and that God's truths are lies. The real battle we fight is in our mind against the devil's falsehoods, which is why we must never stop praying. The stronghold the Bible mentioned was not witches and wizards, nor foundational problems of our family, but the battle of the mind. If the devil wants to destroy you, all he will do is plant a thought that negates the word of God in your heart and bring things your way that will compound on it. If you can successfully bring every thought to the obedience of Christ, you've won the battle. It has been estimated that 5% of adults suffer from depression. Surprisingly, Christians are not left out. Before anyone can get to a point of being depressed, they must have battled with so many negative thoughts based on the whispers of the devil. So, it is important not to give the voice of the enemy a second thought, but disagree with it the moment it comes. Prayer and fasting are also efficient tools to sharpen your sensitivity to the Spirit's leading. Whenever the devil comes with his lies, if you are sensitive in the Spirit, you realize that you'll immediately begin to feel uneasy. This is just to tell you that it is not from God. God's Spirit is his gift to believers in this end time, and praying more in the Spirit heightens our discernment. Don't follow mere natural instincts. Instead, listen and follow the directions of the Spirit of God. Because praying is a dual form of communication, it will require that you wait on God's response. This helps you grow in hearing from God. Not knowing when God is speaking or being unable to discern whether it is God or not can be quite dangerous. Similarly, fasting and prayer go hand in hand, and the Bible mentions fasting as a way of ministering to God. Fasting aids spiritual sensitivity. When you fast, you pay little or no attention to the things of the flesh and pay more attention to the things of the spirit. This singular act often creates an atmosphere conducive to the full expression of the spirit of God. The power of an instrument is known by the level of its sensitivity. Your ability to resist the devil's tricks will increase as your sensitivity to the spirit of God increases. If you are not that spiritually sensitive to the things of the spirit, they are chances that you will miss important things that the Holy Spirit would want to do in your life. You will fall prey to the enemy's traps and manipulations very easily. Why believe that you will die when his word has said that you shall not die but live? Why believe you can't amount to anything when he has bestowed his only son to die for you? Will he not also give you all the things? The devil loses his grip on you the moment you stop paying attention to him. Spend more time praising God. Praises have a way of shifting your focus from your problem and placing it on God. 
It exalts him above your challenges. Decide today to shut out every negative voice. Fix your eyes on God's word and believe what he says. Many metaphors and pictures are used to describe the church. One of them is the picture of the church as a boat on the water. In so many ways, it is an appropriate picture of the church through the ages, sailing through the seas of history. We can apply the symbolism of this picture to ourselves in this way. Jesus is the safe shore. The boat is us, and the water is our lives, or life generally here on earth. Sometimes the water is very calm, and at other times it can get stormy and the waves very violent. Have you ever had a thought cross your mind that made you realize how different things are from how they used to be? Not just in your Christian life, but generally as well. Like ever wondered what happened to that friendship that was so close to that dream you had? How about that vision the Lord had shown you, and somehow you have remembered about it and you're like, how did I even forget? Or something just happens and then it hits your mind and the signs have been there for a while, but you miss them. Because you have been preoccupied with other things and whenever they showed up, you just distractedly dismissed them. And in our boat on water symbolism, that would be the boat is no longer near the shore. It has drifted further into the sea, where it is tossed to and fro by the angry waves. Or even if the sea is calm and the boat floats peacefully, its safety cannot be guaranteed because when the inevitable storm comes, it will have no place of support and it risks being destroyed. And that is why the boat, or rather us, must stay anchored somewhere near the shore, the safe place. I understand that we have so much work to do, work, school, family, friends, and so much more. Sometimes we might even lack time for ourselves. From the time we jump out of bed till we get back, it is a series of things that we have to do. It can be overwhelming. And even riskier, it can distract us and make us drift away from God. The Lord could be there trying to speak to you. He might be having a certain message that he wants you to hear. Or has he been speaking to you for the past two weeks or four months or whatever period, but due to the music, the TV series, TikTok, classes, those road trips with friends, and all the chores around the home you have to do, you didn't even hear. You didn't notice because your life has been so preoccupied. Your mind is busy. Your schedule is very tight. And just like that, you have drifted from God. Or maybe you can call to mind the former days when certain people were tender, full of love for the Lord, praising and worshiping the Savior in God's house. Yet today you know them as different people. Every day they are slowly drifting away from everything they once knew and loved, leaving Jesus and heading in the opposite direction. Drifting away from the Lord is not something that happens overnight. It is not a one-time event, but rather a process that grows more disastrous with each passing time. It is the buildup of prolonged actions that push us further from our anchor, Jesus Christ, what makes it even harder to realize is its deeply subtle nature. Sometimes it is not even the violent storms that make the boat drift away, but even the slightest of winds that flow time and time again. The little things that we do daily seem harmless, but they continuously subtract from our relationship with God, causing us to drift. However, there are certain signs that if we detect, we can realize that we are getting distracted from God who should be our focus when we no longer have a me time with God. Lacking silence in our lives can cause us to drift from God. The importance of silence and alone time with God in a believer's life cannot be overemphasized. Through the Bible, we see how different people were called by God to periods of silence and solitude so that he could speak to them on their own. Even Jesus had the habit of withdrawing to a lonely place where he could pray and connect with his Father. This shows how important it is for us to follow the same example and create such times when we can commune with our Lord. When we can focus on him and do intentional listening to hear what he has to tell us. If we do not appreciate the power and importance of silence, more times than we can think we are going to miss the voice of the Lord. 
We can picture the Lord speaking to us in a small voice as he did to Elijah. And if we are not well positioned in a place of physical, emotional, and spiritual calm, then we are going to miss that voice. And the more we go without connecting with God through such intimate moments, the more we will drift from him. We should examine our daily routines and see if we ever make time to be in the presence of the Lord. And if we realize we don't, then this is the time to start incorporating such times into our schedules. The spiritual things that used to bother us no longer do. Perhaps you have had those moments when you ask, can I be a Christian but just not go to church every Sunday? If we were devoted members of the church and now we feel like it is a burden or an inconvenience, this can be a sign that we are drifting away from God. Our zeal for Christ is dying and our light is dimming day after day. As we journey with Christ, we should strive to be more Christ-like. This means that the deeper we grow in our relationship with him, the more we become like him. The things that anger him make us righteously angry too. The things that break the heart of Jesus will break our hearts too if we are walking in step with him. Drifting away from him makes us lose this character. We begin to become more comfortable with sin. We even label some sins as gravely bad, yet others as just small mistakes that can be forgiven, and later on we begin to accommodate the small sins to fit our lifestyles or our definition of the truth. We no longer involve God in our lives. When the combination of pride and self-sufficiency becomes our driving force, the result is that we remove God from the picture. Pride says, I can do this. I got it. I don't need to consult the Lord on this decision. I don't want anyone to help or approve of it. And self-sufficiency kicks in and stamps what pride believes like, yeah, let's do this. We must be careful lest we become so reliant on ourselves that we forget that we need God. The Bible reminds us that we should not lean on our understanding, but rather we should acknowledge the Lord in all our ways. We should invite him in every stage of our lives. When we are just starting our day or going for an evening stroll after school or starting work at a new company, we should consult God even in those small decisions we make daily. And lastly, but not exhaustively, we are focused on ourselves only. While it is true that we cannot pour to others from an empty cup, it is not a validation for being so self-focused that we exclude others and God from our lives. When it is all about us, what we want, what we would like, what we think is good, and how things make us feel and do not take a minute to look at it from the perspective of God, we are very much likely to drift from God. It is important that whatever we do, we pause and put ourselves in the feet of Jesus. What would he have done? What kind of reaction would make him happy with me in this scenario? Doing this keeps us from drifting far from the anchor that is God and into the dangerous sea of us. The thing with drifting away from God is that it may not pose immediate consequences, which is why it is usually hard to notice when it begins to happen but its long-term effects will always be catastrophic. It is like a man who's drifting on a boat down a river heading towards the falls. He's paddling along, lazily enjoying a Sunday afternoon on the water, but people are yelling from the shore, telling him to stop and row back, warning him of the danger that lies ahead of him. They even throw out a lifeline, but the man smiles back and says that he is okay and nothing is wrong, and soon afterwards, he crushes down the falls and ends up badly injured. The river of neglect slowly carries you farther away from the Lord, and the farther downstream you go, the swifter and more dangerous that river becomes. You don't know it, but there are raging falls ahead, a place where there are forces beyond your control, a place of no turning back, of shipwreck. We must learn to check our spiritual lives and the levels of our connection with God lest we get distracted by our daily activities and forget about him altogether. And when we get that wake-up call, in whatever form it might be, such as in this video, we can make a U-turn and speed back to God. It is time that the drifting ends. It doesn't matter how okay or how happy we feel right now. The fact is sooner or later the problems will start kicking in. 
and then it might be too late. We must start to turn back to the Lord right now. And the most beautiful thing about all this is the Lord is always waiting for us. He will not condemn or shame us for drifting away from him. Rather, by his kindness and love, he will welcome us back into his embrace, where we can anchor ourselves and be safe from the storms of life. Hebrews 2, 1 through 4. We must pay the most careful attention, therefore, to what we have heard, so that we do not drift away. For since the message spoken through angels was binding, and every violation and disobedience received its just punishment, how shall we escape if we ignore so great a salvation? This salvation, which was first announced by the Lord, was confirmed to us by those who heard him. God also testified to it by signs, wonders, and various miracles, and by gifts of the Holy Spirit distributed according to his will. The writer of Hebrews here is addressing the heirs of salvation, all devout Christians who love the Lord. And he is saying, be on guard against drifting. Every believer knows how important prayer is. We know that prayer is one of the pillars of our faith and that prayer is how we commune with our Father in heaven. It is how we communicate with him and make our requests known. There are so many benefits of leading a prayerful life. Many of us desire to go deeper in prayer. We want to be more spiritual, and the way to achieve that is by being more prayerful. There are some of us whose goal in our journey with Christ this year is to pray more and have made this our divine assignment or task. If you've chosen to dive deeper into prayer this year, you're making one of the most impactful decisions of your life, and I am cheering for you. However, I am going to be honest with you on something. It won't be easy. There's an invisible enemy that would like nothing more than to stand in your way. He knows there is so much to be gained from being a prayerful person, and he is not going to let that happen. On some days, he will make you feel like you are not in the mood to pray. On others, he will demoralize you to stop praying because the prayers are not being answered fast enough. That is why today I want us to be encouraged by studying the benefits of praying consistently so that you can keep forging ahead with courage even when you don't feel like it. When you start praying constantly, you grow closer to God. Prayer is direct communication with God. It establishes, builds, and nurtures a relationship with Him. You will be filled with His Spirit who would reveal spiritual things to you and guide you to lead a godly life. He will become your helper, comforter, teacher, and friend. Eventually, you will start to move with confidence because you do not just have an idea, but you actually know who God is. When you begin to pray consistently, God becomes a part of your life. He's not just an idea at the back of your mind, but an actual being, your Father, who you involve even in the most trivial matters of your life. The voice of the Holy Spirit becomes clearer in your life you begin to hear him with confidence. You become familiar with the way he speaks, the way he operates, what he likes and dislikes. And this way, you find yourself closer to God more than ever. This also helps you become more obedient to him and live out his will for you. Praying consistently enables you to hear more from God and be better able to align your actions with what you hear. For instance, when you are praying over a particular situation like a job or moving and receive direction from him, you will have a heart that is willing to obey. When you pray consistently, your faith grows. When we hear about praying constantly, our minds are likely to think about unanswered prayers, and that is right, because it is in the face of challenges that it is the hardest to pray. No one has a problem with praying and thanking God when things are great. However, when things become tough and God seems unresponsive, this is when it is hardest to pray. That is also when we begin to doubt His presence and love for us and feel like we have been alienated from Him. At this same time, the devil comes at us with all manner of lies. However, if we keep our faith and continue to pray, not only will we become closer to God and obey His word, but also our faith will grow. Faith is like a muscle. The more we use it, the stronger it becomes. 
As believers, we should teach ourselves to trust harder, especially when we cannot see even a single reason to. We are supposed to pray harder the times we feel like giving up. It is by doing so that our faith in the Lord will grow. It is not when we are having it all easy, but when everything seems like it's falling apart. Staying in prayer when everything is seemingly going wrong in your life will grow your faith to heightened levels you never imagined. Also, praying without ceasing builds the character of Christ in us. You see, believers are the children of God. We belong to the heavenly royal family. We represent Christ here on earth, and we have been called to be more like Him day by day, moment by moment. We are supposed to be the salt and the light of the world, reflecting the light of Him who reconciled us with our Father, and that is Jesus Christ. Although we are not the source of that light, we are supposed to reflect it and shine it upon the whole world. Through prayer, this becomes possible and easy. We cannot be more Christ-like if we are not engaging Him in prayer. We cannot shine the light of Christ to the world if that light has not filled us first. We cannot follow in His footsteps if we are not yielding to His leadership. Prayer is how we ask Him to help us. It is how we put ourselves at the feet of Jesus and let Him guide us as we show the world the way to Him. When we pray, we ask for the Holy Spirit to fill us, to guide us, to enable us to be more like Christ, so that the whole world can see Him through us. Consistent prayer in your life bears a lot of fruits. While teaching His disciples how to pray, Jesus told them in Matthew 6, 5 through 6, And when you pray, do not be like the hypocrites, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the street corners to be seen by others. Truly I tell you, they have received their reward in full. But when you pray, go into your room, close the door, and pray to your Father, who is unseen. Then your Father, who sees what is done in secret, will reward you. Go into your room and close the door behind you. This means getting rid of distractions, doing away with the things that might pull us away from the presence of God, moving away from noise, and making sure that you are praying with the right motives. Prayer is not for getting the attention or praise of man, but to glorify the name of God. This is a habit that every serious prayerful man or woman must have. Making time to be in the presence of God all by yourself, without the presence of any person or electronic gadget. For prayer to be effective, we must be calm in the spirit and physically too. Every believer must make this a consistent habit of their lives if they desire to get to intimate levels with God. When we do this, Jesus told his disciples that God, who sees what is done in private, will reward us. Prayer doesn't have to be loud for it to be effective. Not everyone must see that you are praying and crying. It is not about how loudly or long you do it for, but all about the sincerity of your heart. What are your reasons for praying? Why do you wake up and go to morning glory? Why do you fast and spend your lunch hours in a secret place with the Lord? This is what Jesus is referring to when he says the God who sees what is done in private will reward you. God sees your motives. He knows your intentions. He knows why. Even though it may be hidden from men, he does and he will reward each person based on that hidden motive. In the parable of the widow and the unjust judge, while teaching about the importance of being consistent in prayer, the judge did not grant the woman her requests because he wanted to. He did not do it because he thought she deserved justice either. He gave her the justice she deserved so that she could stop being a nuisance to him. I don't fear God or care about people, but this woman is driving me crazy. I'm going to see that she gets justice because she is wearing me out with her constant requests. Luke 18, 4 through 5. Jesus is driving this point here. If this judge, as unjust, uncompassionate, and as unqualified for the job as he was, could grant the woman her request because of her persistence, how much more will loving and holy Father give what is right to his children? When praying, we must know that results do not always show immediately. Our timelines are not the same as the Lord's. Persistent prayer requires tenacity and resilience. Daily, we will face many hurdles that may put a damper on our prayer drive. 
Life involves disappointment, loss, injustice, and persecution. All very good reasons to give up and lose hope. However, a life attuned to God's presence, justice, and goodness, all covered by consistent, genuine prayer, is a life that can endure. This widow's persistence illustrates our need to pray without ceasing. Prayer changes us more than it changes the people around us. It deepens our faith and trust in God and empowers us to wait with hope for God to act. It's the reason why Jesus ended the parable to his disciples with the question of whether or not the Son of Man will find anyone faithful when he comes. Which is to say, as Eugene Peterson put it, will he find men and women who are still praying, who have not given up, who have not lost heart? The gospel of this passage challenges us not to just pray, but to trust in God, even when the answers that we seek do not come immediately. Will we have enough faith to endure until change happens? The Bible has so many examples of people that reaped great rewards from consistent prayer, from women like Hannah getting a son despite being called barren, the widow we have just studied about getting justice from the uncompassionate judge, to Paul and Silas being released from prison. With prayer, you will never go wrong because it opens so many doors. It is the door to infinite breakthroughs, opportunities, and blessings. The breakthrough you have been seeking, that specific thing that is constantly on your mind, could be just a prayer away. Do not give up on prayer. Great things happen when you pray without ceasing. Rejoice always. Pray without ceasing. Give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. 1 Thessalonians 5, 16 through 17. The subject of Christianity has been in existence for over 2,000 years. Over the years, humans have developed doctrines from the pages of the scriptures, some of which are self-destructive. These are what I call myths about Christianity, and you really shouldn't be stunned knowing that these myths have led many into error. Myths are simply false beliefs or ideas that have been widely accepted or held in high regard. One such myth is that God's love towards you is dependent on you being good or bad. Beloved, nothing can be farther from the truth. Romans chapter 5 verse 8 says, But God demonstrates His love for us in this, while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. This Bible verse says it all. God does not love you because you are a good enough person. He loved you even while you were still in the world. In His love, He declared you His righteousness, giving you the privilege to live the life of Jesus because He took your place on the cross of Calvary. This belief is a fallacy and a self-destructive one at that. If you believe your mistakes will make God stop loving you, you'll be forced to try to do good out of compulsion. You'll find it difficult to approach God when you fall into certain sin or temptation because you'll be overly critical of yourself. Your sense of guilt and I'm a bad person who can never do right will keep you away from God rather than running to Him. To be frank, God wants us to always desire to do the right thing out of love for Him and not out of compulsion or guilt. If we only obey God out of fear of Him, withdrawing His love from us if we fail to meet up with His standards, then we are prisoners. But no, God's love is to bring us to freedom and liberty and to make us experience the joy of salvation. The Word of God says there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Condemnation is the fruit of guilt. It makes you feel you can make God love you and you can make God hate you by how well you live. It has pushed many into trying to prove to God their worthiness of His love. My question is for how long will you do that? It makes you feel you'll be a better Christian when you hate yourself and punish yourself for falling into sin rather than turning to God and simply repenting of the act. The burdens of guilt can be so self-destructive. A good number of believers have trodden on this path and it led them to absolute loneliness and self-hate, which ended up severing their relationship with God. It ought not to be so. God knew that there will be times when you will fall into sin and that's why He made provision for the forgiveness of your past and future sins. He did it out of love. 
he does not want you to cut off your eyes because they lust, but rather to turn to him and repent, knowing that it hurts him to see you continue in a life of sin. Your self-imposed righteousness is not going to make God love you more. If that were enough to bring about your salvation, then there would not have been a need for Jesus to be crucified in your stead. Moreover, there is no sin too great that God cannot forgive. It doesn't matter the gravity of your offense. When you come to God and admit your wrongs, God will immediately forgive you. He forgives you because He loves you and would not want to have you perish by continuing in sin. Psalm 103 verse 12 says, As far as the east is from the west, so far has He removed our transgressions from us. Your acts of goodness alone cannot justify you before God. If that were the case, the atheists and the people of all other religions out there who are doing good will all be entitled to eternal life in heaven. The second myth that people believe about God is that they would no longer have to suffer when they're in Christ. Some people even came to God as an escape route from the troubles that life has to offer. As much as God does not derive pleasure in seeing you suffer, He doesn't promise you a life void of challenges. He only promises to be with you, hold your hand, and help you through all of it. Isaiah chapter 43 verse 2 says, When you pass through the waters, I will be with you, and when you pass through the rivers, they will not sweep over you. When you walk through fire, you will not be burned. The flames will not set you ablaze. There's a common quote I've heard even from the people of the world. We don't grow when things are easy. We grow when we face challenges. This is so true and applicable to everyone on the surface of the earth, be it a Christian, pagan, or anyone. The challenges of life are independent of religion. The tribulations of life have no respect for any man. Of course, God has the power to take away all your sufferings. But He won't do that because He wants you to grow. He'll be doing you a great injustice by letting you see life as a roller coaster ride. So if you've thought that with God you won't encounter storms on the sea of life, then you're walking in ignorance. My response to this will be, no, you're having a misconception about God, knowing that He has not promised to keep you out of the fire but rather to be with you in the fire will help you not to be taken unaware, knowing that as long as you live in the world, you will have troubles, but that you can rest in the peace of God because He has overcome the world will help you not be offended by God when challenges arise. The Word of God says, casting the whole of your care, all of your anxieties, all your worries, all your concerns on Him for He cares for you affectionately and watchfully. The advantage you have over the people of the world is not a struggle-free existence, but rather a faithful and loving God who will help you through your struggles. If you ask me, God cares about you more than you think you know or can imagine, and there is nothing you are struggling with which He cannot help you overcome. The Bible tells us that nothing on earth can separate you from the love of God, not even your challenges. I know life has a way of making it look like God doesn't care about you, but that's not true. However, this becomes an idea in our heads when we experience situations that appear to be dead ends, when we lose a loved one, or when our pain tarries. A great number of people have backslidden from their faith in God because of this lie. When the storms of life began to rage, they couldn't keep holding on to God because they believed He didn't come to their rescue when they wanted Him to. The third false idea and belief people are holding on to about God is that He is too loving to send anyone to hell. The grace of God is amazing, but it has been misused by Christians who want the benefit of being with God but don't want Him to change a thing about them. If you have this ideology that God is a loving God who cannot let the ones He loves be punished whatsoever, then you haven't read where it's written in the Bible, for our God is a consuming fire. He is a loving God, but He is also a just, holy, and righteous King. Matthew chapter 25 verse 46 says, Then they will go away to eternal punishment, 
but the righteous to eternal life. God would be unjust to those who have dedicated their lives to living holy and abstaining from everything that has the appearance of evil if He gives them the same treatment in the afterlife as sinners. God's mercy and grace upon a man's life is only for as long as the man lives. The scriptures say it is appointed unto man to die once, and after that comes the judgment. Jesus is now a loving shepherd. But when he will return for his bride, the church, he will return as a king and a judge of all nations. He will judge everyone according to their deeds, and he will reward everyone according to the works of their hands. If it is iniquity, the penalty will be death and eternal condemnation in hell. But if it is righteousness, the reward will be life everlasting in heaven." Don't be misled by anyone who preaches the gospel and tells you half-truths. Be enlightened by the pages of the Bible, for that alone is a way of escape from eternal condemnation. God loves everyone, yes, this is a fact that cannot be argued, but He certainly will let the people who forget Him face the consequences of their unhealthy choices. I know you believe there is a heaven, the place where Jesus said He is going to prepare for you. How come you don't believe there's a hell? Because the Bible talks about both locations. Some believers read the Word of God, filter it to suit their needs and fleshly desires, and make a doctrine out of it. The problem is not the doctrine they make out, but the errors in their personal beliefs and views. They, however, go out there and make disciples, teaching them to walk with such errors. Today, many people pose for Jesus but live their lives as though they're the originators of the world and its systems. Don't tell me you believe they won't drink from the cup of their folly and wickedness. Of course they will, because God has set a day for judgment and no ungodly man will escape His judgment. Anyone can walk into these errors if a constant check is not applied. There is a need for you to be open to God's correction, especially at this age. You may have to learn, unlearn and relearn a whole lot of ideas and personal opinions about God. Harboring false impressions about God will keep your relationship with Him marred. You may never grow in your walk with God if some of these myths aren't done away with. Check yourself to see if you've been walking in error in any way. Admit it and trust God to help you walk in His light. Amen. Spiritual warfare is our battle against the devil and everything associated with him. We can't choose whether to fight or not. The battle is already set against us even before we were born. The devil is on a rampage to get as many believers as he can before he runs out of time. A soldier does not stand on the battlefield and fold his arms. That soldier will get killed and buried unceremoniously. We are to fight with the armor God has made available to us. It may seem like the problems in your life never end. Everything around you becomes difficult. Things keep moving from bad to worse at an alarming speed. That tells you there's spiritual warfare. That is when you need to pull out your sword and wield it over the devil. You need to let him know that you will not succumb to his cheap games. But most times, believers are not sensitive enough. The goal of the devil is to kill, steal, and destroy. He will not stop at anything until he gets you to curse God. He wants to take away every precious thing in your life. He will not stop at anything until he sees that you have lost your faith. The Bible tells us in 1 Peter 5, 8, NIV, Be alert and of a sober mind. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. The devil is always on the lookout for whom to devour. He is always moving to and fro to spread his influence around. Can you remember his conversation with God in the book of Job? God asked where he was coming from, and he said he was coming from walking to and fro the earth. His target is you and your faith in God. The sad thing is, you are not always vigilant. You often get carried away with the seeming calm you see that you forget you are still on the battlefield. You forget that the devil is still trying to take away your faith. He is doing everything in his power to steal your joy. He is not relenting in his aim 
to destroy your testimony. Every day, all believers are on the battlefield. We are fighting against sin. We are waging war against the craftiness of the devil. We are resisting the devil so that he will flee from us. Some days are harder than others in our fight against evil. We fight to live righteously. We fight to take out time from the distractions of the world to study our Bible. We resist every temptation and say no to the desires of the devil. Daily, we need to choose to please God rather than the devil. That is warfare. Ephesians 6.12 NIV says, For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. This is our reality as children of God. We are soldiers who have been enlisted in the army. Whether on the battlefield or in the barracks, we are constantly fighting and should be on guard. You can experience an intense attack from the devil. That is, when it seems as if all hell has broken loose on you. Everything in your life is not working. Your faith, which should be your sucker and drive to the place of prayer, suddenly vanishes. That is the point of warfare. Spiritual warfare can be in form of oppression or intimidation from the enemy. You might just find yourself losing the courage to stand up for the things you have once stood for. You discover that you can no longer speak up against evil. That is the time to activate your armor and fire them up. But most times, believers are too busy to even notice the little drift in their lives. Job was a model Christian whom God was proud of. The devil was angry at this. He wanted to take away Job's testimony. Job lost everything he had, including his children. I can't even begin to imagine how devastating that must have felt for him. He removed his clothes in sorrow, but never lost to the devil. After losing all he had, he was afflicted with a sickness that left him in ashes. His wife, who should encourage and cheer him up, chose to discourage him. She was tired of being called the wife of a wretched, sick man. She asked him to curse God and die. She was simply telling him to give the crown to the devil. Can you imagine how God would have felt if the devil went back to him to boast about winning over Job? It would have been a disgusting scenario. Thanks be to God, Job held on. He fought like a champion. He faced the difficulty without losing his faith. Then he said even if God should slay him, he would still praise him. Job won the fight. Are you also going to win the fight? Job had rested after his battle. He had received the crown. He is rejoicing now. Will you also receive the crown? Are you going to win the battle or drop your armor during battle? Will you allow the distractions from the world to drift you off thereby allowing the devil to win? In Ephesians 6.11 NIV, the Bible says, Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. If we would not face battles, what do we need armor for? Think about it. Have you ever considered getting a weapon for your child? Weird, right? Exactly. You know your child does not need it. Why then do you think God provided an armor for us? It is because we would be fighting battles in this world. Jesus said in John 16:33 NIV, I have told you these things so that in me you may have peace. In this world you will have trouble, but take heart, I have overcome the world. Jesus has already paid the price for our victory. He has won the battle for it already. All we have to do is stand and enforce his victory over our lives. You need to know that every day is another day to fight. Never believe the idea that there is a day you do not have to put on the full armor. The devil never relents. We are the ones who get too busy to pray fast or study our Bibles. We neglect our armors until the arrow reaches us. We are always on the battlefield. Each day, the battle between good and evil plays in us. The spirit fights against the flesh. Every action we take shows which part won the duel. There are times in your life when you receive special attention from the devil, just like Job had. Those are moments when every part of your life does not go the way it ought to go. 
that is a time for spiritual warfare. That is the time for you to enforce your victory. It is not the time to cringe, cower, or entertain fear. The time when persecution arises from every corner is a time for spiritual warfare. Can you think of a time when you felt like you were walking on swords? Everything around tries to take you back to your past. Your old friends may try to lure you back to your old habits. Your boss is threatening to fire you if you do not do what he is asking from you. Then your spouse starts acting up. You even think the devil has possessed them with the way they get irritated with every little thing you do. With everything going on, you feel you are about to lose your mind. That is when you know that the devil has proclaimed war on you. When the things you face get more intense than they used to be on normal days, the devil is out to get you. He focuses his attention on you and uses every trick in his book to get your back on the ground. Will you allow him? It might be that you have just lost interest in the things that are related to God. You no longer feel like reading your Bible or praying. Your spiritual commitments become boring. You prefer to do every other thing than to spend time doing the things of God. That is the sign of an attack. That is a time for you to drop everything and retreat into the presence of God. It is a time for you to stay with God until He restores your first love. Since we know that we are on a battlefield with the devil, we should never get caught unaware. We should not get lost in the things happening around us that we forget where we are. Our battle does not end with one victory. Because you overcame the temptation today does not mean that the devil will not tempt you tomorrow. Never relent in wielding your sword against the devil. Knowing that battles would come our way does not suffice. We must also be ready for them. God did not leave us helpless to the devil. He knew all that we would have to face as saints walking through this sinful world whose prince is the devil. God has prepared a way out for us. Like he turned everything around for Job, he will turn everything around for us. As long as we keep our armor on and are vigilant, we will not fall prey to the devil. Revelation 12, a NIV says, They triumphed over him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. The blood that Jesus shed for us on Calvary is a point for our victory. Don't keep running from pillar to post in search of a solution to the problems. It is time for you to go to God in prayer. Prayer is a strong weapon given to us. With it, we get to call the name of Jesus, step back, and watch Him enforce His victory on the situation. When facing challenges, we should not panic because Jesus has won the victory already. All we have to do is enforce it in our lives. Anything you notice in your life that is not according to God's will should not be left there. You should earnestly contend for the faith once delivered unto the saints. That does not sound like being timid or passive. Our call is not to timidity or passivity. We are to stand in our offices and continuously fight against the enemy. I want you to know that the devil can never win against you if you do not allow him. He can try. I mean, he can use every trick at his disposal. He can fire every arrow he has. He can use every weapon in his armory. But he can never get you because Jesus said, he had overcome the world. The devil remains a defeated foe if you do not give him a chance to come in. In Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12, the Bible says, For the word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and spirit, of joints and marrow, and discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. The word of God is living and active. In other words, it works. The Bible is the word of God. It is living. It has life. The moment that God inspired someone to write it, he gave his word life. But we are supposed to make it active and working in our lives. We all have the responsibility of bringing into actualization whatever the Bible says. We're supposed to bring about the miraculous working of what God has said in the Bible. It's only you who can activate this word of God. And if you don't, 
yes, it will be there. It will be in living existence, but in your life, it will be dormant. I don't want you to get confused by these two aspects of the Word of God. When God speaks it, He makes it living. When you speak it, you activate its power in your life. That's when it starts to work in your life. That is when it starts to act upon that situation. That is when the Word starts to give you that peace, that inner joy and comfort, that satisfaction in the Lord. Until you read the Word of God, believe it, and speak it over your life, it is simply like a dormant seed, like a seed without the right conditions for growth and reproduction. But when you believe it, personalize it to your situation, and speak it over your life, you place it in its most fertile ground, and it goes ahead to bear multiple and long-lasting fruit. What happens when you speak God's Word over your life is that it becomes active, it actualizes, and whatever God has said in the Bible about you and your life begins to make sense and begin to be a reality in your life. When you speak the Word of God over your life, you give it that power to go ahead and fight for you. You give it the authority to act on situations and on people to make them compliant with what the Lord says. When you speak the Word of God over your life, you begin to believe it. The promises made in the Bible become promises made to you and not just something written down in the Bible. There is power in the tongue. It might be a small part of the body, but it is one of the most powerful. It can cause chaos and it can also stop war. The tongue can put out raging fires and at the same time, it can light fierce fires as well. The tongue can curse and it can bless. It can bring relief and peace and it can cause anxiety too. It can break some relationships and build others. It's that powerful. So when you speak the word of God over your life, you tap into this unfathomable power of the tongue and in the best way possible, you tap into the power and authority that the words of your mouth possess. You bring into action the magnitude of effect that the words of your mouth can cause. When you say something over your life, it as as well as beginning to live it, to look like it, to behave like it. The tongue is that powerful. The words of your mouth are that powerful. That's why Jesus told his disciples that you shall speak to this mountain, tell it to be uprooted and to be planted into the sea, and it will do so. In Ezekiel chapter 37, the prophet of God only spoke to dry bones and they acquired life. He only said words to them and flesh came upon them, covered them, and the breath of life entered them, making them live again. That's the power of the Word of God when spoken over and into our lives. The whole universe was created by the Word, not just words, but the Word from the mouth of God. He only said, let there be, and there was. Let there be light, and there was light. Let there be a vault between the waters to separate water from water. Let the water under the sky be gathered to one place, and let dry ground appear. Let there be lights in the vault of the sky to separate the day from the night, and let them serve as signs to mark sacred times and days and years, and let there be lights in the vault of the sky to give light on the earth. And all these came to pass. The creation story continues, and we see how, just from His Word, God created a whole amazing universe with all its beauty and wonderful creation within it. Isaiah chapter 55 verse 11 says, So shall my word be that goes forth from my mouth. It shall not return to me void. It shall accomplish what I please, and it shall prosper the thing for which I sent it. The word of the Lord, what he has said in the Bible, will come to pass. But it won't become a reality in our lives if we don't believe it and speak it for ourselves. If we don't take it personally and own it, and receive it as if it were just written for us. If we do not speak the word of God over our lives, yes, it will come to pass, but just not in our lives. God says that his word will never return to him void. That means that at least one person is personalizing it in their lives. At least one person is making it happen in their lives. One person is providing it with the ground in which it can multiply and bear fruit. At least one person in the world is living it. 
and how I pray that you will be that person, that you will learn to speak the Word of God over your life, that you will learn how to counter challenges and difficult times with the Scriptures, that you'll begin to read the Bible and meditate on it as if you were the only target audience, that you will begin to source your strength, inspiration, and courage from what God says. I want you to start speaking the Word of God into your life, into your financial life, into your social life, your family, your academics, your health, into every single aspect of your life. I want you to activate the wonder-working power of the Word of God. I want you to tap into His amazing power and glory and authority by beginning to own and actualize what He has said in the Bible. The Bible is your manual for day-to-day -day living. It's all you need. The Word of God has everything that you need to live a positive, righteous life every day that you wake up. When Jesus was tempted by Satan on the mountain after fasting for 40 days and nights, he overcame the temptation by speaking what was written in the Bible. Three times the devil tempted Jesus to sin, and three times Jesus overcame the temptation by quoting the Word of God and telling Satan what God says. Three times Jesus spoke to Satan, it is written, and Satan's schemes were defeated. Listen to his three responses. It is written, man shall not live on bread alone. It is written, worship the Lord your God and serve him only. It is said, do not put the Lord your God to the test. Luke chapter 4, verses 4, 8, and 11. Afterwards, the Bible says that the devil left Jesus because he had been defeated by the Word of God, which is the sword of the Spirit as described in the book of Ephesians chapter 6, verse 17. When you speak the Word of God over your life, you bring life into seemingly dead situations. John chapter 11, verses 43 and 44. When he had said this, Jesus called in a loud voice, Lazarus, come out! And the dead man came out. When Ezekiel prophesied over the dry bones, they gained life and became living again. When you speak over whatever circumstance in your life that seems to be dead right now using Scripture, it will regain life. You can speak dead situations into life. You can restore health and friendship and finances. You can speak a job into existence and it will find you. You can command an illness out of your body and it will leave. You can order your evening today to be a certain way and it will be so, because the Word of God never returns void to Him. Just by quoting the scriptures, you can say this over your life. Cancer, leave this body, because by the wounds of Jesus, this child was healed. Stress is no longer my portion. I shall not be anxious about the future or be afraid of anything. I shall have peace of mind because God will give it to me, a peace that transcends human understanding. That is my portion from now onwards. Finances come into line because my God shall supply all my needs according to his riches and glory. Devil, come out because you are overcome by the blood of the Lamb. You can use the Word of God to build your self-esteem and confidence. By owning Psalms 113 verse 9, I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful. I know that full well. If only you could realize how much power you hold in your tongue. If only you could know how possible it is for you to turn things around, you'd transform your life forever. You'd begin to live differently and positively. You'd stop lamenting at how things are and start speaking them into how you want them to be. You'd stop living like a victim and start living as a conqueror in Christ Jesus you'd start to live in the awesome reality of the Word of God in your life. God is faithful. His Word is true. It is powerful and it carries with it authority. It brings life out of death. It sheds light where there is darkness. It restores what has been lost. It casts out demons. It brings healing to the sick. It gives sight to the blind. The Word of God turns situations around and transforms people into the best version of themselves. You don't have to be rich or powerful or educated to transform your life. All you need is to speak the promises of God in your life. 
the Word of God spoken in faith in the name of Jesus has awesome power to overcome seemingly insurmountable obstacles. Romans chapter 10, verse 8. The Word is near you. It is in your mouth and in your heart. That is the word of faith we are proclaiming. That centurion in the Bible understood this. He asked Jesus to speak the word of God by faith and his servant would be healed. Peter understood this. In Acts chapter 9, verse 34, he spoke out, Aeneas, Jesus Christ heals you, condensing several healing scriptures into five words. And that is what happens when you speak the word of God over your life.